this morning, we're going to go to Luke chapter number 2. For our scripture. We've talked over the last few weeks, last few times that I have been able to to bring the word about the gifts that God has given us through Christ. Talked about how he gives us strength and how he gives us joy. And so this morning, we're going to talk about the gift of presence. Not with a T at the end of it, but presence as in God with us, his presence with us. So uh, I'm just going to read in Luke chapter number 2, starting at verse number 13. It says, Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. It came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go now unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful passage of Scripture recorded so long ago by Luke that we still draw encouragement and awe and strength from even today. Lord, I pray that you would help me to rightly divide the word, that you would help me to say what you would have me to say. Help us to have ears of the Spirit to hear what you are saying to us this morning. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this Christmas series that we started back right after Thanksgiving, called it The Gifts of Christmas. We're talking about the gift of presence, presence today. And I, I started thinking about some of the pretty useless gifts that I have received over the years. Probably none of you ever have, but I've received some things that were pretty useless uh, for me over the years. You ever get <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. I had talked one Sunday about how my least favorite thing in the world, I think, are those canned, uh, uh, store-bought canned fruitcakes that you can get that come in the tins. <laughs> and guess what? We had waiting on us after church, one of those cans, and I just thought, oh, man, I just made myself look like a heel. Somebody brought me one. Inside of it was homemade cookies and stuff. They had just reused the tin. But for just a minute there, I thought, pack the U-Haul. We've already, we've already. But there are some things that I've received, and I think I've learned how to be a little more gracious over the years, and you just, you know, you smile and you say thank you and appreciate you thinking of me. And uh, I'll tell one more story. Rhonda, the church we were pastoring when Caleb was born, they had a secret sister thing that lasted all year long. You, you did something every month for your sister. And so uh, we were new. Most of the ladies were, you know, we were not 30 yet, and most of the ladies were <clears throat> twice our age or, or more. And so uh, Rhonda re-gifted something that we didn't get from that church. It didn't come from that church, but it's something she wasn't going to use. It was some scarves and some pins that hold the scarves together, and she re-gifted. That Sunday night, we got to church early, and that lady was sitting there in church, and she was saying, why in the world would my secret sister give me scarves? Have you ever seen me wear a scarf? I don't wear a scarf. And there was Rhonda who had just given it to her. So obviously a gift that was... Uh, that was something that was not needed or wanted. Uh, but uh, uh, that's one reason when Johanna came to me and said something about starting up Secret Sisters, I was a little hesitant because of, of experience we had had before. But I want you to know that the gifts, and you know this, the gifts that God give a, gives us are never irrelevant. They're never something that we didn't need. 
They're never something that's not good for us. What God gives us is always uh, something, always something that is needful and that is useful and that is personal and pertinent to our situation. Sometimes we may not know the pertinence of it at that moment, but given time, we come to see the value of all the gifts that God has given us. We talked about joy. Thank God he gives us joy for the journey, amen. There are days when we need that joy just to make it out of bed, just to go another step. We talked about how he gives us strength. Uh, once again, there are days when maybe we don't fully realize how the strength of God is keeping us going, and there are days when, it, if not for God's strength, we wouldn't have made it. And so this morning in, in our time together, I want to talk to you about the gift of Christmas itself or or the relevance, the reason, and the result of the presence of God with us. So first, it's the relevance of the gift. God came to earth. The relevance of the birth of Jesus Christ is summed up in that one little statement. God came to earth. Listen to how Paul said it in Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together." That's just a beautiful passage of Scripture where Paul talks about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. He's not only the image of the invisible God, but he's the creator who made everything. Not only is the, he the creator and the, and the image, but he's the one that keeps it all together, keeps it all working and running and moving towards its determined purpose. Jesus did not start at the stable. He existed before creation, and he is the agent by which everything that has been created was created. He's the Word. The Word was in the beginning, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word became flesh, as John would say, and dwelt among us. He is the Creator, the God who created the universe did something that is more relevant to your daily life than you might have ever considered. As Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, have this mind among yourself, which was in Christ Jesus, who, although he was in the form of God, let me stop there, in the form of God means made of the same stuff as God. We might think of the form of as being a like similar to or like, you know. Well, my mother decorated a beautiful Christmas tree, and mine is in the form of. It's, it's, it's kind of like that, but it's not as good. No, that word form of means made of the very same stuff. Whatever it is that God the Father is made of, Christ is the same stuff. He's made in the form of God. Sorry, that's a little aside, but it's important. Being the same form of God, he did not count being equal with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. You know, this is some of that mystery that for our human brains it's really hard to get a grasp on, but Jesus was God, same stuff as the Father, equal in his being with God the Father, but yet he sat that aside. He allowed that part of his nature to be set aside, and he became fully man. The, cre the creator became part of creation. And, you know, the church has struggled with this from the beginning to explain it. How could he be fully God and fully man? But that's what the Scripture says. Even if our minds can't quite comprehend it, it's one of those points of faith. 
that he set aside his divine nature so that what was infinite could become finite and, and be in the form of a man to live among us, to walk among us, to die for us. But yet he never was not God. What a beautiful thing. What a wonderful thing. How relevant that is for us. He came into this world in the same way that everybody else comes into this world. What do you mean, preacher? He was born of a woman the same way as the rest of it. You know, good thing he's God and I'm not because I might have thought of a more, more theatrical uh, entrance, you know, some kind of a big scene, uh, maybe, you know parachuting in at halftime of the Super Bowl or something, you know, spectacular. But he's born in the stillness of a night in a place where they kept the angels to a poor family that nobody would have even noted had happened had the angels not burst out with the message and had a star not shone brightly in the sky. It would have passed as any other birth that had ever, that had ever happened. What a wonderful God we serve. The God who created the universe humbled himself to come to earth as one of us. Not only that, but he wasn't born in a rich man's home. He wasn't born in a king's palace. He wasn't born to the emperor or the ruler, but he was born to a poor family in a tiny village and was birthed at the stable. So why? Why would God do it this way? The best thing that I have ever been able to sum it up for myself is he was born this way because he came to save us and not scare us, <laughs> right? He came to show us that everyone had access to salvation through his life, his death, and his resurrection. He was born the poorest in a nowhere place so that everybody can have access to Jesus Christ. He came in a way we could all relate to so that he could be both God and and man. Think about it. He was born like us. He grew up like us. He was tempted like us. He struggled like us. He had the same desires as us, the same drives, the same passions. He suffered as we suffer. He struggled like we do. He faced discouragement like we do. I could take time and expound on each of these through the scripture, scriptural examples of, of what I'm telling you this morning he faced anger he faced frustration but yet through it all through it all he did without sin he showed us what is possible for us through faith in him as the son of God and as the savior of our souls what a wonderful God what a wonderful that's why it's so relevant to us all of this is really good news because it assures us that Jesus understands how we feel. You know, think about that. If he struggled like we struggle, and he faced temptations like we did, and he got aggravated, and he got disappointed, he's going to understand the things that I'm going through, the things that you're going through. So when we cry out to him in the midst of something that shakes us, in the midst of a pain, in the midst of a struggle, in the midst of a disappointing moment, in the midst of a holiday season that's lonelier than it has ever been before, when we miss loved ones who are not here or who have journeyed on ahead of us or just sometimes the things of life that discourage and weigh us down, the Lord understands. He is moved by the feelings of our struggles because he has walked among us and not as impervious to the things that happen to us, but he felt as we feel. You know, there's something to it when you go and talk to someone who has been through a similar situation. When you have faced cancer and you speak to someone who has also faced cancer. When you've been through a divorce and you speak with someone who has been down that road. When you've had a miscarriage and you speak with somebody who has miscarried, there's just something about knowing that that person knows what it is that you're going through. You know what I'm saying. Our Savior knows what it is, not because he read about it in the book, not because he watched it from a distance, but because he experienced all the things 
that we experience. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus our Lord. That's why it's so relevant that he came to be with us. That's why Christmas is such a big deal, because it made God relevant to all of us. How could we relate to a God that's far off, that, you know, watches from heaven above, and sure, we can talk to him through prayer, but he's never experienced the pain and the struggle and the hurt of of walking through this world, the joys and the, the highs and the lows. But our God has, and he knows what we go through, and he's there for us. God came to earth as a human, and he split time. And I know the big movement in the last several years has been to stop calling it before Christ and and year of our Lord, B.C. and A.D., and they want to do before common era and after whatever. I don't know. But it still splits at the birth of Christ. Regardless of what you call it, there's before Christ came and there's after Christ came. He changed time. This is the single most significant event that has ever happened in history. Oh, but we can't prove it. Well, this is just an aside, but let me tell you, if you research that, there is more historical proof that Jesus was born, as the Bible says that he was, than many of the historical figures that we read about in our history books that we just take for granted that surely they lived. It's verifiable. You don't have to dismiss your brain at the door (laughs) to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God who came to live with us. That's the good news. The second thing is the reason. The first one is the relevance. He came to relate to us. The second point this morning is the reason. God came for us. He came for our benefit. How in the world would it benefit the king, you know, the the son of God, the creator, the sustainer, to come and experience what it's like to be limited and struggle and and run out of energy and need to eat and, and be betrayed by friends and not believed by the people that he came to save? He came not because he needed to, but he came because we needed him to. Does that make sense? Not because he needed to, but because we needed him to come. He needed us. <laughs> Preach too long. The candles got too low. <laughs> Why did we need Jesus to come to earth, earth, pastor? Well, I already mentioned this in the relevant part of the message, but he needed, we needed him to come to earth to show us what God is like, to show us what Jesus is like. You know, Romans tells us, Paul writes in the book of Romans, that nature is a witness to God and to the fact that there is a creator. And man, we can truly look at this world around us, go outside when it's dark and look at the beauty of the stars and the moon and and look at the, you know, the wonder of creation. We can get microscopes and and study things that are too small to be seen by the naked eye and all of it says there was a creator who had a plan and a design right we know that he's creative just by looking at the world around us just think about this how creative is our god that we can all across this world be identified as unique individuals by our eyes They can scan your eye, and it's different. They can scan your fingerprint, and it's different. They can take a piece of your DNA and be sure that it's a unique individual from everybody who is, everybody who was. What a creative God to be able to design all of that. Just look at all the different kinds of trees that you see as you drive through Uh, drive on your way home just think about all the different kinds of wildflowers that grow up just of themselves unbidden all the different types of animals insects all the different uh, varieties of of things that are out there he's a creative god we know he's a powerful god he can just speak and all these things happen i'm just talking about by looking out there with our own senses we know god is organized we know god likes variety one time when I was pastoring in Prescott, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was in Rising. We were getting ready for Sunday night service, and in small towns, you typically don't get a lot of visitors to your Sunday night service anymore. 
well, this guy showed up that I'd never seen before. Uh, and so I went back to speak to him before service. And it was, it was campaign season. And he was running for a county office. And he had been campaigning on Sunday afternoon. He was intending to attend service at the Methodist church, which was on the same block. But the Methodist church didn't have an evening service. So he came on down to our church. <laughs> so uh, that church was particularly exuberant in their worship. <laughs> what do you mean, Pastor? Uh, shofar horns and flags and tambourines and particularly exuberant. People that would pound on the wall with their palm. and Anyway, so I felt the need to kind of warn him a little bit that uh, our worship service was going to be different than what he was used to in the Methodist church. Didn't try to scare him off, but I didn't want to look back there and worship and see this guy heading for the door like what's going on in here you know and the reason I bring that up is because he said something that I thought was so beautiful it stuck with me for for these years he said you know I have determined that our God likes variety a lot more than we do when I look out on a field that hasn't been mown a, a pasture or something that hasn't been mown and mown or cut you'll look out there and you'll see all different kinds of wildflowers that have been growing up. He said, one, God did all that. And that was his answer to the fact that he was going to have worship that was different than what he was used to. And I thought, you know, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I like that. God likes variety. But there are things about God that we could not tell about him with our natural senses. Nature doesn't teach us that God is loving. In fact, if you look at how nature works, it kind of looks like God is survival of the fittest, right? Nature's pretty rough and pretty tough out there. Nature doesn't teach us that God forgives. There's not a whole lot of second chances out in the natural world. Nature doesn't teach us that God has a plan for your life. Only Jesus lets us know what God is really like. That's why he had to come, to show us that God loves us, to show us that God has a plan for us, and to show us that God forgives. He also came to show us how to live. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus teaches us that true life True satisfaction, true success comes from allowing Christ to live in us and through us. In other words, he set the perfect example. As I've already mentioned previously in this message, he set the perfect example of how to live through the temptations and the struggles and the pain of life and yet not sin against God or against his word. He's the perfect example. There is a greater cause, we know that, because of Jesus. There is a greater purpose to life than simply doing what feels good and gratifying yourself. There's a, there's a higher purpose. And Jesus shows us that. If in no other instance that I can think of, at the, no, I can think of no better example of what I'm trying to say than on the night when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, just hours before the cross, and he said, if there's any other way, let this pass, right? I know that's a, my paraphrase, but he, he said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cut pass. Huh? What's he saying? This isn't what I want to do. Nevertheless, I'll do it because it's your will. Wow. If any scripture speaks to the self-gratification of our culture. It's that passage right there. Sometimes, in fact, mostly, we should live our lives for the glory of God before we worry about, is that going to be a good experience for me? But we get so selfish. Jesus gives us the example. He came to show us that we can trust Him. You know, you can't really trust somebody that you don't know, right? You can't really trust somebody that you don't know. No. That's the reason some of us don't trust God more. Because we don't really know Him very well. The more I serve Him, the more I trust Him, the more I see that He can be trusted with my money, with my marriage, with my health. 
oh, what's going to happen? You know, I can trust God with my future. I don't have to have all the answers because I know He will give me grace when that time comes to face whatever it is that we're facing. The more I know God, the more I serve Him, the longer I live, the more I understand that I can count on Jesus. <laughs> we can depend on Him. We can count on Him. He's trustworthy in all His ways. We've learned to trust Him in baby steps, and that helps us trust Him with the bigger things. We've seen Him heal in times past, and we trust Him to heal again today and tomorrow. We've seen Him work out our financial difficulties in the past, and we trust Him with those things in the future. We've seen Him bring peace when our lives were troubled, and we'll trust Him in the future. You understand what I'm saying? He came to show us that we can trust Him, that He is trustworthy. We can put our lives in His hands, and we can rely on the promises that He has given us. He came to show us how to be forgiven. He came to earth to forgive everything that you've ever done wrong so that you can spend eternity with Him in heaven. Listen to these scriptures. 1 John 3, 5. He appeared in order to take away sin, for in Him there is no sin. Praise God. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to take away our sin. Oh, but you don't know the things that I've been involved with. You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the people I've disappointed. You don't know the commandments I've broken. Well, I don't need to know. God knows, and He still sent His Son to take away your sin. It's available for all of us. You don't know how many times I've done the same thing over and over. I've told God I'll never do that again, and then I fall. He came to take away your sin, not just once or twice, but as often as we'll come to Him and ask and truly ask, God, I hate that I do that or say that or, or, or keep falling into that habit. Please forgive me. Help me to be stronger and to learn from the lesson. When we come truly asking for His help, He gives it. He forgives us. Philippians 2 says, I've already read that scripture, but I'll read it again. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He came to die for our sins. <laughs> we talk about the beautiful picture of the manger scene. and We portray it every year in our homes and in our churches. Thank God for the manger. Thank God for the birth of Jesus. But He didn't just come to be born. <laughs> he came to die. He came to die to take away the sin of the world. He came to take away our sin. He wants to forgive you, and it's called grace. And that's the only way that you're going to get into heaven is by the fact that Jesus came to freely forgive that all we have to do is ask and believe on Him in our heart and our sin will be forgiven us. I didn't earn it. I've been a bad person. You couldn't earn it if you were the best person that ever lived. But Jesus gives it freely through faith by grace. Think about this. Our salvation doesn't cost us anything on the front end. All we've got to do is ask and it's given freely. But it costs Jesus a lot. He left His eternal throne. He left His home. He became a human. He had aches, pains, and troubles, and was rejected. And then he laid down his life, and he paid with a death that was horrible and excruciating. He didn't stay in the crib. He went all the way to the cross. Why would he do that? He did it because he loves you. He did it because he loves you. And if you were the only one, he would have done it to save you. He loves me and you more than we can ever possibly understand, I do believe. But I like what John wrote in 1 John 4. In this was the love of God made manifest among us, that He sent His only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent His Son 
to be the propitiation. That's a big old word that means the covering for our sins. I know you've heard and you've said Jesus is the reason for the season. But let me go a little deeper than that. You are the reason for the season because you're the reason Jesus came and that we celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ. If you had not needed a Savior, Jesus would not have come. If you had not needed what only Jesus can offer, Jesus would not have come. Christmas is God's gift to us. And then finally this morning, the result of the presence of God, we can know Him. We can have relationship with Him. You can have a personal relationship with God. Paul said, For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. More than that, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What does he say there? He said he saved us, he made us right with God, and he teaches us how to live. But it's not only life lived in awe of a God that is far off. It is life that is lived in relationship with a Savior who walks with us and talks with us and helps us along the pathway every day of our life that's the most wonderful gift that can be given there is nothing that compares to the gift of relationship no matter how nice the gifts are that we receive from family and friends none of them can come close to the relationship that God has given us what do you mean Well, look what Luke said back in the beginning when we started this. The angels announced to the shepherds, for unto you, for unto you is born a Savior. It's personal. He's not just the Savior of the world. He's my Savior. (laughs) He's not just the God of my ancestors, the God of my parents, but He is my God. He is not just the one who watches over everything, but he's the one who watches over me. He's not just the God who hears prayer, but he hears my prayer. He's not just the God who answers, but he answers me. He's not just the God. I could go on and on. It's personal. It's personal. He gives gifts, and he provides what I need for my daily journey. And that doesn't take anything away from what he does for everybody else. Our God is so wonderful and so all-present and all-powerful that while he's taking care of Travis, he can take care of everybody else who calls upon his name, even if we're all asking for his attention all at the same time. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, our Lord. You see, it's practical. It's the most practical gift ever. It's something you need And something that will be useful to you today, tomorrow, for as many days as he gives. And in fact, for all of eternity, the gift of salvation that God has provided for us. You see, when Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost, we always think about the value of the soul and truly that's a proper way to think about it, but you know what he, what that also says to us? What was lost, what was lost was relationship. What was lost was relationship. Look back in your Bibles at the beginning in Genesis. What was going on there was relationship. When God created Adam and Eve, what happened? He came and visited every day. He spent time. There was a relationship with them. What happened when they sinned? They hid themselves. They had to be covered by a sacrifice. There had to be animals sacrificed and their hides made into clothing for Adam and Eve. God had to remove them from the garden and he had to put an intermediary, someone to go between himself and man. Relationship was broken. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He wants salvation for our souls, but folks, he wants relationship with us. 
He wants to be able to walk with us and to talk with us and to commune with us. And that is available to us not only one day a week when we come to church, not only on special holidays and occasions, but daily, 24 hours a day. If I need to wake up at 2 in the morning and call out upon God, if I need to, to, to walk the floors in the middle of the afternoon, if I need to go out in the yard and talk to God, if I need to come to the church at some odd hour of an odd day of the week, wherever I am, whenever I need Him, there He is because of Jesus Christ and the way that He has opened for us. What a fellowship. What a relationship we have with the Lord. So let me ask you something very personal as I wrap this up this morning. Have you accepted God's gift for you, His personal gift of Jesus Christ as your Savior? He came to be relevant to you. He came to show you the way, and He came to give you relationship. And have you accepted that? There's no better Christmas gift that you could receive this Christmas Eve than to accept Christ as your Savior. You see, don't wait any longer. An unopened gift is useless. It makes me think of a story that I heard a preacher tell a long time ago. The son of a wealthy man graduated from high school and was getting ready to go off to college. And Before he left to go off to college, he was expecting his dad to really shower him with gifts. Before he left to go to, to college, his dad gave him a Bible. And he was so upset. I'm shortening this story down for the sake of time. You've probably heard it. It's old as the hills. But he was so upset at his dad. He went off to college, wouldn't come home, wouldn't talk to him. Time went on. Finally, finally, after a long period of time, the young man's graduated college. He's got a job. You know, he's married. The relationship has been broken all these years. Finally, he said, Dad, you were a man of means. You could have provided for me. But I had to go off, and I had to get a part-time job just to buy an old junker car so that I could make it to classes, and I had to work to pay my tuition, and I had to... Long story, his dad said, Son, you still have that Bible that I gave you? In every page of that Bible... His dad had tucked in money, wanting his son to get in the Word and read the money for his car, the money for his clothes, the money for his food. It was all tucked into the pages of God's Word. He's like, wow, how could he have missed that? I know that's a paraphrase of a very long story, but I think you get my meaning. Yet, how often do we pass by through our daily lives without receiving the gift that God has made available for us to be able to talk with and to pray to and to just fellowship with, to commune with, to share with, to receive strength from, peace from, joy from our wonderful Savior. My sister years ago, back in the 70s, 80s, used to sing this song that the gist of it was he was there all the time. He was waiting patiently in line, but he was always there waiting for me to turn to him. Don't miss the best gift you could receive. Turn to Christ. How do I do it? Simple as ABC. Admit that Jesus is God and that you are not. Believe that Jesus loved you enough to pay for all your sins and still desires to save you. And confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Commit to his plan and his purpose for your life. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach your word today. I pray that you would speak to the hearts and the lives of the individuals that are here this morning. God, minister to each and every need today. Father, if there's one in the room that needs to take a step of salvation, that today would be the day that right now they would do it. If there's somebody that just needs to say, God, I need you now. I'm saved. I've trusted you for my salvation, but I need help right now. That they would take that step today and receive from you. The greatest gift of all, the gift of presence of God in our lives as individuals. 
Amen. So we have a couple of other things planned, but there's nothing more important right now than giving you a chance to respond. This morning, if you are not absolutely certain that Jesus is your Savior and that if your life were to come to an unexpected end today, that you would make heaven your home, would you come right now to this altar? Let me pray with you. Let me help you receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's the most important thing you could ever do with your life to accept Jesus as your Savior. Is there one? Maybe somebody will be watching this. Say, Pastor, how do I do that? Just simply ask. You say, Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came to die for my sin. And I confess right now that you are my Savior. I believe in you. You are saving me from my sin. You pray that simple little prayer, and then I want you to click on Facebook on that link under the video, and I want you to contact me so that I can follow up with you. Because I want you to be sure of your salvation. Hallelujah. Let me pray for you this morning before we do the poinsettias and close with communion. There are those in the room that are hurting physically or spiritually, and you need a touch. I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for all those who are suffering with physical pain this morning for healing. God, I pray for those who are suffering, Lord, today over the loss of loved ones, over an empty place at the table this year, over distance. We can't be with loved ones because they're far away. Lord, that emptiness in our lives, I pray for the joy of the Lord and the peace of God be in every circumstance and every situation. Those battling, God, with unknown wars and unknown enemies and unknown struggles, your help, your strength, your joy, your presence in their lives, God. Today, let it be made manifest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.